next speaker, as I said earlier, is uh, many of you <coughs> will, will know Maura Ayrton. Um, Maura is, is the national spokesperson for the Shell Sea campaign um, and has been actively involved um, in the campaign in Mayo uh, for over 10 years. Um, so I'm going to ask Maura. Maura is going to just outline uh, and discuss um, the campaign that the community has mounted uh, in Mayo, uh, the pressure that they've come under, um, and also uh, to, to remind people, I suppose, and some su the, the successes um, that that campaign has had, um, one of which has prevented Shell from expropriating 10 billion worth of, of gas um, from uh, Corp. So I'll pass on to Maura. Um, thanks, Maura. Thanks, Stuart. Um, just in, in honour of, of the, the meeting at which I'm speaking, just on a personal note, um, I have three daughters and one son in that order. And my son has James Connolly within his name. And that was my my part. It's, uh, it's right where to start. I think with this, it's called the Real Map of Ireland, published by the Marine Institute. And the red line border shows the actual extent of giftedness that this and previous governments actually have. And a friend of mine, Magella McCarran, who spent 30 years in Nigeria and who knew Ken Sarah Weaver before he was judicially hanged at the behest of Shell, said the first thing she thought of when she saw this map was that it's fairly analogous to the shape of Africa. So, when you think that at this time, now at the beginning of the 21st century, you now have a race for the fossil fuel reserves, which have to, by any stretch of logic, exist out here. I mean, the oil companies would have us, they try to have us, a small community, right here on the western periphery of, of the west of Europe, believe that in all this area there happens to be a little bit of gas down here and a little bit of gas just here, a medium-sized field, one TCF. And really, that's all that's in us. And in all the planning process, in all the consent process that we willingly engaged in, and engaged in in good faith from the year 2000 onwards, the line all through was that this was just one medium-sized field. The gas reception facility, which is what it was called, before it became a refinery, which it had to be properly called for an, an EPA license. That really, it was not much different to building a bungalow in a park. It was really kind of like Falcher Road gas. You know, you'll just come in here and the little drop of water that's there, you know, will be removed and anything removed from the gas reception facility will be a better quality than what you had there beforehand, which was actually pristine quality. <laughs> so it started from, from that point, and we started from the point of knowing absolutely nothing about the whole gas and oil industry. Why would we, unless we, we, were, we had chosen to study the, the field, as I said, we live here, in a greenfield area, a barony that's a natural resource in its own right, at a time where places are increasingly commodified and corrupted. We have clean air, clean water, clean soil, sight of the night sky, and the sound of silence. And it was that which galvanised me from the beginning, my prime tenet all along has been place, the defence of the place 
that is Eris. All of us as people come and go the blink of an eye. And it's those who came before us who sustained the place that we now live in and have to pass on to those who come after us and the American tribes a view of taking a view for the next seven generations. And we are that kind of people. I mean, we're a, a rural people. We have a strong oral background, the, the oral stories and sagas and songs of the country. And given the nature of that, we could spot corporate spin a mile off. <laughs> because part of storytelling is telling gallows. I don't even have an exact translation, but when you've told a few gallows, you can certainly um, recognize them, and we could do it a hell of a lot better than they've even tried to. <laughs> so, everything had been set up. The, all the ducks were in a row, as Joanne pointed out. I mean, oil companies play a, a long game. They know what's out there. They set up, and of course they had willing accomplices in the likes of, of Ray Burke and Bertie Hearn, and a servile, psychophantic mindset anyway in, in all the Civil War parties. So they had it easy until they decided to take the cheap option and bring their plunder ashore in the barony of Ellis. And I have to say at this stage, I mean, we don't lose the run of ourselves, but given where we came from, a sparsely populated area, and the amount of research and learning we had to do from 2000 onwards, it is no mean achievement that now into the second decade, it's still 50-50. And it's, I would say, thanks to ourselves at the local level first, because all politics is local, and then as awareness gradually got out, thanks to national and international supporters. And it, the Shelter Sea campaign has those two elements. It began, as I said, at the local level. For myself, it began with defense of place. But then, as we learned more about the giveaway terms, it developed a firm national focus as well. So you have the local, which is environmental, health and safety concerns. And they remain and will always remain. And you have the national, which is the, I mean, scandalous doesn't even begin to describe the terms that the oil companies enjoy. So we have, we have fought for the past 10 years. At times we've fought among ourselves, but then that's one of the definitions of community in, in my own book, those who fight together, stay together. And while there have been differences in emphasis and emphases along the way, the bottom line remains the same. The proposed carbon gas project is the wrong project in the wrong place. And Stu said, you know, along the way, all right, we, we had our appeal to Board Planola upheld in 2003. You know, and the, the inspector then, Kevin Moore, said this was the wrong project in the wrong place. It defied any logical definition of sustainability. But, of course, the oil companies came back. They had Imno Creve and Frank Fetty from Fianna Fáil, the neighbouring county in Fianna Fáil, called what we described as a Nuremberg rally, where they brought every Fianna Fáiler in the place into... Um, sports hall in Belmullet and uh, described it like not unlike the call of the Irish to Patrick which he heard in a dream come back. <laughs> um, same thing 
and she called on Shell, you know, not to go away. And local people didn't actually realize the significance of that at the time. So I did my so because how Shell used that was in the wider sense of things at their AGMs they would inform concerned shareholders well the people asked us to stay and to come back so then they had all their um, all their planning ducks in place next time round uh, John O'Connor who has to qualify, or he's certainly well up there so far this year for the Hippocrates of the Year Award. Because I heard him yesterday, he's retiring as chairperson of um, World Plan Order. He's been there for the entire um, length of the, the current thing. He's retiring after 11 years. And he expressed regret that um, Work plan all hadn't really called the, the planning mania to um, to halt. He didn't express regret for facilitating Shell in granting them permission for what is a planning expressus. At the moment it, it that decision is before the High Court for a judicial review. Um, it's interesting that on Tashka, the heritage body, who are, they have taken a review along with two local people who live in Rossport. But on Tashka, cites as one of the reasons for doing so that if the thing were to go ahead, then it has broken so many EU directives and what everyone thinks of the EU and the rest of it, why it is at the moment the statutory, whatever you want to call it, they set the rules, they set the directives, and they find the citizenry of the country for breaking them. And once they start <coughs> implementing daily fines against the country, again, it's the hospitals, the schools, the social welfare people, who will pay the price. Not Shell, not Ray Burke, not Bertie O'Hearn, or any of the others. So I won't keep talking. I would just point out a couple of things. The Irish Offshore Operators Association, which is the um, lobby group for the oil companies, um, on their website on the 3rd of November 2010, they published this. Now, this was just a month after the last World Plan Oral hearing closed. And at that hearing, Shell and their apologists had stated categorically that the interconnectors between Ireland and Scotland couldn't be used to export gas because they weren't engineered for it. Now, I would imagine anything that's engineered one way can be engineered the other way, but that's neither here nor there. But they stated categorically it couldn't be done. One month after they had got <coughs> their embarrassment of an oral hearing out of the way, their lobby group states, should we find ourselves in the fortunate position of having gas production greater than Irish demand, two more corrobs would do it. The pipelines already exist to export to the UK and beyond. And there it is from the horse's mouth. Finally, I'd just like to try to get across to you the importance, I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted in a lot of cases, but to re-emphasize the importance of what's going on in North Mayo. And to that, there's a, a good article by Lawrence Cox, who um, lectures in Maynooth. It's in the Irish Left Review, and is up on the um, Shelsea website. But what 
we are doing. And what we have done for the past 10 years is to hold the line on anything that is half decent in this country. And while all around us were losing their heads and a hell of a lot of money which they didn't have in the first place on building up their property portfolios, we continued to live in the real world. And we had very real problems to deal with. And we're still doing it. But we stand for what is real, for what is worthwhile, and for what essentially will determine the future direction of this country when we're all dead and gone. And in historic terms, at any point in history, those who study it subsequently study what happened. It's only those who go into any point in history at a, a greater level that they read around what could have happened at the time. Now, where I'm coming from, and there's a lot more like me in North Mayo, is that we do not want to be studied at master's level or PhD level. We want to be a determinant of history. And the, the proposed CARAP project is a determinant. And I think and believe that given the, the state this country is in, given the level of anger, powerlessness, all that, that goes with that of the citizens of the country, if you want to cut the legs from under the rottenness that is currently endemic in this state, you do it in Rossport and Glengat. Because, as we all know, it's the winners who write the history. All we need, all of us, who would be at the left of the assembly, is to win. And this is eminently winnable. It takes a sufficient number of us to determine the course of this country for its second hundred years after 2016, and by hell, it needs a decent course for its second centenary. Thank you.